Good afternoon and good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the Finos virtual meetup this morning or um, this afternoon, depending on where you are, whether you're in the US or whether you're in the UK. Um, I'm James McLeod, the Director of Community at Finos, and I'm delighted to be um, joined by Connor O'Neill, Chief Product Officer, and Jo O'Shaughnessy, Head of Propositions from Nearform, who are a Finos Silver member. And the team are here today to walk us through the unexpected story of Nearform from OSS Mavericks to launching the world's most successful COVID-19 app. Now, before I pass over to Connor and Jure, I'd like to ask people if you have any questions, please put them in the WebEx chat um, as I'll uh, pass them over to the team um, in the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, and also this afternoon, we're going to pick two people from the audience to win um, a Finos t-shirt each. And so if you've not registered um, for this webinar, please go to finos.org um, and register for the um, attending the webinar. And we'll pick um, two people at random to win a free Finos t-shirt. And whilst you're there, um, remember to su subscribe to Finos on LinkedIn and also on Twitter, where you, you can hear about um, all of our up and coming events. Um, including the Open Source Strategy Forum that's coming up in the future. Um, and also uh, visit finos.org to get involved and register for news and events updates. Um, and if you are a developer or an engineer or interested in um, Finos open source projects, please visit github.com forward slash finos to start contributing and getting involved in our projects. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass you over to Connor. Hi, Connor, it's over to you. Great, thanks, James. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm glad you could join us today. Um, as, as James mentioned about the Q and A, like we're really, really interested in any questions you have about any of the topics in this webinar because we're, you know, in twenty something odd minutes, we're going to cover quite a bit of ground. So, you know, don't limit it to anything to do with um, contact tracing or or open source. Just you know, hit, hit us with whatever you like. We, we're, we'd be delighted to to answer those questions. And then the other thing we'd love to hear. Um, from you all by whatever means doesn't have to be in the Q and A and so on, but just by, by you know by by email, reach out to us. We'll have our email addresses at the end. Um, is just what you found valuable in in what we presented and what you'd like to hear more about because you know we want to we want to contribute as much as we can to to fin us as members and and kind of deliver value for all of you. Um, so just to briefly present yourself, so my name is Conor O'Neill, um, I'm Head of Product um, and Jer is Jer's Head of Propositions. I'm based in West Cork in the southwest of, of Ireland, where it's famous for its cheese and it's famous for its views. Um, Jer is based in Dublin, which is famous for a lot more things than cheese and views. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get on to the, that, that topic of where we both are um, in a moment. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Nearform, the company, if you're not familiar with us, it, it is an unusual company. I mean, we, we, we use that word Mavericks in the title. Um, fundamentally, we're a professional services company um, and we build web apps and mobile apps for, for mostly large organizations around the world. But doing that and the way we've done it has led us into some you know, particularly interesting areas. So we're we're headquartered in a tiny little place called Tremor. It's a it's a seaside town in the southeast of Ireland. UK people like a little Brighton, and for the US people like a little Santa Cruz. It even has amusements and so on. So you wouldn't expect to have sort of a world leader in certain aspects of open source base there, but it, it is that, that that's where headquarters is. But because it's there, and because not every top developer. Uh, that you want working for you wants to work in a place like that. We've been a remote first company since the start. We're, we're entirely distributed. Um, so we have people in over 20 countries. I think it's 27 countries now. Um, and they're working in distributed teams. So it's not that we have a team in country X and they only do projects in country X. Any given project, it brings together the right people uh, at the right time. Um, the company started about 20, 2011, 2012, and the founders uh, went all in on Node, hence the gigantic uh, Node logo there on that, that screen. Um, 
and really for speed and agility. They found they were able to deliver projects a lot quicker with Node than with any other technology. And they bet on it early. So they bet on it when it was sort of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, uh, and it turned out to be the right decision, which was you know phenomenal for the company and really helped drive its growth. But yeah, on top of that, Kean, yeah, Kean imagine our CEO, he really does have this deep belief in the power and importance of contributing back to open source. It's not about just consuming it and has always believed that um, and it's actually led to us spending very serious percentages uh, of our revenue in supporting OSS over the past few years um, which we'll talk about more in a second. Um, I won't spend too long talking about these we call them other OSS projects so we, like, we support a lot of open source not just the node core project itself where we put it we have a you know we've, over the years we've had a huge number of people uh, that we supported full-time in, in many cases uh, uh, working on Node. But I'll just quickly briefly talk about three, we'll call them building block OSS projects that we're involved in. Clinic.js is something we built from scratch. It's there just to make Node developers' lives easier. It does the types of performance analysis that there, you know, other tools can't do. Um, and you know it's corporate o uh, open source, but as of last week, it's now got its own GitHub org, uh, and it has been relicensed from GPL to MIT, really to help drive the community around it and, and have more people involved in it. HTTP three isn't something you need to be worried about today, but it is going to be a hugely impactful uh, piece of technology, uh, a massive jump over HTTP two and HTTP one point one, um, and you know it's actually going to be something you'll pay attention to as a developer, whereas you may not have. With, with you know the older ones that it was just what you used uh, we're actually doing the implementation on that for for node and then finally worker threads in node node itself uh, it addresses the biggest criticism of node you know that it's single threaded and that was actually conceived and developed by uh, Anna Henningsen in, in your form uh, the other thing we're heavily involved in is inner source and I think if if there's a lot of um Kind of people who have been on Finos webinars to date, you know, you'll know Denise. Denise is on on the line uh, today as well. She's done some phenomenal webinars to to Finos uh, uh, on this topic, and it remains a really really important thing for near form. And actually, uh, one, one thing a lot of many people aren't aware of it really to play a key role in our involvement uh, with the Irish COVID nineteen contact tracing app project and and help drive a lot of the activity there. Um, the phrase, you know, why invest so much in open source? We get asked that a lot, particularly as we're not a, you know, we're not a huge company. We're 160 ish people. Um, you know, so who are these kind of crazy Irish guys? They're based in the middle of nowhere, but they're building apps for EY and ADP and the New York Times, uh, and they're contributing more to node companies, you know, a thousand times their is so like why do they do this stuff um and it actually boils down to uh, when i was joining airform about three and a half years ago i asked uh key and the ceo if you want got the sense he wanted to you know leave a, a, a mark on the world and he said i want to leave a star on the planet um but in a good way um and that really has driven so much of what that, that that approach to yes we're a commercial organization but we want to do more than just be a commercial organization and we have absolute faith that this idea of sustainable open source helps everyone it helps us you know, as a business but it helps everyone we work with uh, and, and far beyond that and it really has enabled us to deliver like 150 plus enterprise apps um since since we started but really it was 2020 and it was covid where this combination of major contributor to open source, remote working, and the ability to deliver incredibly quickly came together in a, in a you know, a perfect storm, kind of in the opposite sense of a perfect storm for us um, to help in this fight against COVID-19. Um, and on that, I'm actually going to hand you over to Jer, who's going to give you a little bit of context around how we work and, and the way we do things. Great. Uh, thanks, Connor, and, and hi, everybody. Uh, I I've only have a few slides, and the idea is to give you just a flavor of near form and the context uh, of what we're doing. I think Connor has given the background, I suppose, and in some ways, this is a story of an open source company growing up and growing out. So, really, we're a full stack development company. We're lucky enough to um, work with some household names around the world, and, and, and that's growing. Um, and, and as Connor mentioned, the remote first is quite interesting in that it's now become a, a really important thing for people over the last six months, but for us, it's just part of the DNA. 
I, I wanted to just give a flavor of what we do, but also maybe get feedback from people. We're learning and we're listening to the market and it's kind of pulling us in different directions. And we're um, uh, really excited about what we're doing with things like accelerated development and um, kind of applied open source at the enterprise. So I just wanted to kind of touch on those and it might raise a few questions. And that's why I guess we, we see here, we do digital solutions, but we also do um, capability. If you, uh, next slide, Connor, thanks. Um, but it's a pretty typical engagement arc, I guess, for a solutions company in that we are often, even for one client or one partner, we, we were asked originally for advice, which leads to a digital solution. Um, um, but more and more, I think, particularly with the open source background and the growth of maturity of open source and enterprise, um, we're being kind of brought in to do more and to provide more of a platform and that and that's becoming quite a strong theme for us now uh, both as a company and we feel in the market as well so the two interesting things here i think are that we've invested a lot in what we call accelerated development over the last few years so all of our team bench time and a whole bunch of architecture time has gone into accelerated development which i'll explain and that's leading us into accelerated enterprise which um is really I guess the application of the best of open source into enterprise to drive what we call real transformation. So there's been an awful lot of talk about business transformation, digital transformation. A lot of it has failed. What we're finding is the practical application of the best of open source is actually a great way to start delivering real impact. So, so those are our engagement models. We're primarily digital solutions. So as I say, we have large teams in place with large companies for years that are kind of moving towards a more digital enterprise and capability building. Uh, on the next slide, I'll talk about uh, accelerated development, what we mean. So uh, we, I, I think if you looked at our philosophy uh, across the team, it's an ounce of architecture is worth a pound of code. So we're very heavy on, on architects, uh, technical directors, assistant technical directors. They're a quite an opinionated bunch um, and they hate to do boring, repetitive work. Um, we make a living by delivering high quality software at speed. So what we've found is that uh, a lot of uh, companies, a lot of people are reinventing the wheel or they're struggling because of the plethora of new technologies, new tools and new processes that are out there. They're struggling to start the project because of the decisions that have to be made. So we feel, and we're pretty certain based on all the um, uh, evidence we've seen from the front line, that the, the the drag of the tech choices, picking the tools, setting up the team, and setting up the environment is dragging thirty or forty percent of your budget out of the project. What we've done over the last few years is develop what we call accelerators, um, and it's more than just an approach. It's a full tech stack. It's documented tools, processes. I'll give an example in a second. Um, to kickstart the project um, and for one of our clients recently we we got to working on features with the users within about four days where it would normally be four weeks um, so we feel in particular scenarios for whether it's uh, cloud native uh, or cloud SaaS, uh, Polaris there is the one we talk about today it's more front end it's more mobile and web combined it's not really omni channel it's more multi-channel um, but I, I can give an example of it. We feel that that as a tool and an approach is brilliant for our clients because they get more features for the same budget. We get started quicker, we get finished quicker. And we're also finding a lot more value that they're, they're coming up with. And that to us is of interest in this fitness organization because it's, I think it's an approach using open source that can benefit everybody. Um, I'm going to talk through those. I'm going to show a really technical architecture diagram. Please don't ask me questions or I'll, my ignorance will be exposed. Um, exposed. But on the next slide, um, you can see Polaris. It, it's an example of the amount of work that goes into doing things right, I guess. But if you were to pick out a couple of points here, the way that we advocate using a core of React and React Native allows you to get apps out on iOS, Android, and web using a single code base and a single team. And the way we break that down into components is what's actually helping us to concurrently develop uh, eight or nine of these big COVID apps uh, in different countries at the same time. So what we're finding is that, that um, taking the time to get the best of open source and the best architecture is actually what's driving 
um, our ability to deliver at, at scale. So, like uh, I think Connor will go into this a, a little later on, but we're, we're delivering a lot of apps uh, to different countries and different governments that are not all the same beyond the Bluetooth tech, but we're doing it in a way that's scalable and repeatable with, with very little uh, in the way of regression. So, part of that is the component architecture. The other thing I'd say about this is this is what we think is best, but if a particular enterprise doesn't want to use Storybook or doesn't want to use XState, that's okay. They can be swapped out. Uh, they may not want to. They may want to use JavaScript rather than TypeScript. So it's not a uh, carved in stone architecture, but it is our best approach in our own development projects. We use it. Uh, working with enterprises, we swap in and out the bits that suits them that suit them the best. Um, and it's having an impact. So if we look at the next slide, I can just give a brief flavor. Um, I talk a lot about financial services, but one example I hear, and I know there's a couple of people from IBM on the call, so um, a good shout out to them. We, we've recently uh, looked at open banking. So open banking is live and working in uh, Europe and UK and probably most certainly on the way to the US. <clears throat> um, using the accelerated approach, we were able to develop a working open banking app in about three weeks. Um, and we can point you at the end of the presentation to a link to the full slides and full webinar. Um, it, for IBM, I think it was a great example of how to use cloud packs. For us, it was an example of using the Polaris front end accelerator to get a working app for interbank transfers. Um, beautifully designed, well run and up and, and running in about three weeks. So it, that's an example for financial services. Uh, the other thing we're learning is that it's highly scalable and I think um, Connor will go into this, is that we're able to produce different apps around the world very quickly in the COVID example. So essentially we're building, using the accelerators, an open source platform to deliver services rather than separate apps. And it's working really well. Um, lastly, uh, I just look at where that grows up to and what we're finding in the real world now is that addressing bigger problems for enterprise is one of the themes that's coming out for us. Um, there isn't a large enterprise in the world that doesn't have some form of front-end legacy, um, to take one example. So the average enterprise is carrying some, some app from marketing, some app from a, a failed transformation or a transformation hangover app, I call it, and four or five other apps that are, are spread across different teams and different technologies. You often these days, have more, you're, you're supporting more technologies than you are engineers. Um, and we're talking to CIOs in the UK, US, and European markets now. We're all not in their head figures to do this. That the the front end is has got sprawl. The impact is uh, slow innovation, high costs, multiple teams, and and a lack of confidence about where the skills roadmap is going to go to. Um, so what we're doing with, uh, for example, Polaris is providing a technical transformation uh, path, uh, which is going to a much stronger target front end, like a digital platform. We have one client in North America right now that's doing that and taking on Polaris as their target platform for 100 uh, technologists for the next um, five years. So we'll be uh, publishing a case study in that soon. I'm, I'm aware of time. I wanna hand back to Connor uh, very quickly and happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Ger. Um, I'll cover now what we've been doing in the past 20 odd weeks uh, around uh, contact COVID-19 contact tracing and exposure notification. Um, very briefly, um, I'll, I'll <laughs> describe uh, how it works um, for those of you who don't know if you're in countries that don't or states in the US that don't have this yet. Basically, when you have one of these apps installed, uh, Google and Apple run a service that broadcasts uh, anonymous identifier, Bluetooth identifiers that change every 15 minutes. Uh, your phone sees those, it logs them. If you're uh, uh, proven to be infected, Contact Tracing Centre will ask you, will you upload the keys you've been broadcasting in a particular time period? And then every phone gets those keys. And then on their phones, they can go, whoops, um, you know, I have actually been exposed to that person for more than 15 minutes, you know, and they were within about two metres of me. All of the matching and the, the keys and all that sort of stuff is happening locally on the phones rather than happening on, on kind of at the back end. The back end only acts as a conduit for sharing those keys anonymously. So it's an entirely anonymous private system to enable people to know that they have potentially been uh, exposed to somebody who's infected with COVID-19. So that, that's it in a nutshell. Um, and th that's how the, the Google Apple system works. 
Um, so we were asked, um, we basically got a call on bank holiday weekend uh, in March from the health service executive, which is like the British NHS, uh, asking us, could we build um, a, a contact tracing app and could we do it in a couple of weeks? So we said yes um, and got started that evening uh, using all of the tech that, that Jerry has just been talking about, in fact. Um, built in, had a, a core prototype working in a couple of days uh, and an app ready to release within four weeks. Um, but it was, as is known, an old style application, a centralized application. Uh, as soon as Google and Apple uh, released their decentralized model, the model I've just talked about there, uh, luckily the uh, HSE jumped on it, as did we. So we, we spun it around. Um, and again, within a couple of weeks, we had um, one of the world's first um, con decentralized contact tracing applications. Uh, it then turned out to be, in terms of launch, the most successful worldwide. Um, we're currently uh, 1.7 million installs have happened in Ireland, which you know, uh, Southern Ireland has a population of around around four million, um, and has been installed by about 40 percent of let's call it addressable uh, pe people um, in in the south, um, and uh, is already and this is the important thing for the HSE is already proving its worth uh, many times over in terms of people getting notifications that they've been exposed and going through the whole process to get tested uh, and so on. So it, it's been a huge success. Um, it doesn't just do contact tracing, it also does symptom check-in and information updates and so on. Um, we have another podcast coming on Friday. Go onto our website and go onto the COVID-19 uh, page if you want to register for that, or we're going to we're, we'll be going to massive level of details with the actual implementers uh, of the code, both on our side um, and uh, from the HSE side. Uh, if you haven't seen one of these apps before, here's just a couple of quick screenshots to give you a sense uh, of how the Irish one works. Uh, we get a couple of hundred thousand check-ins every day. That's a little symptom checker. It again only runs on your phone. It's really for you to to kind of track how you're doing and how you're feeling. Um, and then you can see the various stats that are happening globally in terms or in, in Ireland in terms of cases and so on. Um, a couple of quick uh, highlights there. Um, we've had we're, 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 we've been building nine apps to date with a lot more coming. So we should be covering a population of about 53 million people by the second week of September, um, which is which is incredible. And we're seeing a, a, an average uptake so far in the apps that have been released of about 40 percent. As I said, very, very quick release. We haven't had any security issues yet. Um, the interoperability piece, though, is particularly important uh, in an well. First of all, in an Irish context, because you have two jurisdictions on the island of Ireland without a hard border between them, and a lot of people who live in one jurisdiction and work in the other um, traveling every day. So the Irish and Northern Irish apps, both of which we created, are fully interoperable in terms of sharing the anonymous keys. So it doesn't matter where uh, uh, you know exposure has happened, you will get notified irrespective of which app you're running. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the code and the Linux Foundation Public Health. Um, in a moment. Um, this is, again, just to give you a sense of what we've been about. So the Gibraltar app, which we built, is very different, for example, to the Irish app. It only does contact tracing. It effectively has no UI other than what you see there. I have tested positive. The Northern Irish app, again, very, very different UI. Um, similar functionality. Two big question marks for two massive ones, which we'll be announcing in the next couple of weeks. And then along the right there, you'll see Pennsylvania just announced that they'll be going live in the next few weeks uh, with an app that we developed, Delaware, Scotland, the same, um, all using a very similar code base, which is, which is f phenomenal for us. Um, but this is, you know, for, to, to do a story arc, and I know we're under a little bit of time pressure, but to do that kind of full story arc from, you know, a little company based in a little town, um, jumping on Node.js, no jumping on open source, um, and, uh, you know, getting it right effectively in terms of uh, contribution um, and, and doing all of this, and then that full arc to here we are now, where um, the code we wrote, uh, you know, relying on open source that we wrote um, and that many others were involved in, uh, will now be the basis for you know a huge number of, of COVID nineteen apps worldwide. And when you think about um, you know the, some of the things that we have worked on that are all being used uh, within this application, so 
Um, you have uh, you have Node, so our but you know the back end is is, is using Node. Uh, front end is is JavaScript. We have we contribute to the React Native project itself. Uh, we're using the Fastify Web Framework, which is built by a Nearformer. And, you know, and I, I I could go on and on about you know every aspect uh, of that of that open source. But what ended up happening then is the the original uh, HSE app they they released it as open source so for. Some people could see how you know how the apps were built. That there was no back. This was a, a critical part of the overall launch was the trust piece. But uh, then, as we then started uh, getting opportunities, particularly in U.S. states, it was realized that you know let's take that code base and donate it into the Linux Foundation Public Health, which is a new group within Linux Foundation focused on obviously public health and um, and really make it a, a true citizen in terms of being an open source project that many people are are contributing to um, and taking from you know and, and building uh, building solutions on top of and and that's you know it was it was incredible for us to work with the Irish government to achieve this and you know big props to Denise as I said on the call who was heavily involved in this um, and it's really particularly exciting for us that that uh, you know a very traditional Health public health authority like the HSE, similar to many others. So, you know, a conservative organization moving from, we'd almost call it a suspicion of open source to embracing it, you know, in the original launch for them to actually becoming evangelists for open source and for public health using open source in the space of 20 weeks. You know, and if I, I think that if if an organization like that can move that quickly, given the situ situation we're in uh, in the world, there should be nothing stopping any conservative business, you know, know achieving the same thing so it's been huge for us um and and finally i just want to talk a little bit about and complexity and i and i do think it's important that sometimes oh you open source that you basically you know made your github repo knock yourself out to everybody it's open source that's not what covid green at all there's there's a lot of moving parts there's a lot of organizations people uh, both on the open from the open source world but also from the commercial world uh, involved in this uh, and a lot of states particularly u.s states and you know countries involved so there's there's a lot of as i said there's a a lot of stakeholders in this um all involved in taking from contributing to and involved with uh, having this as a highly successful open source project um and it is, you know, it, it has proven a challenge and there's, there's absolutely, you know, no way of avoiding it. It has proven a challenge for everybody involved in this to achieve this. You know, we've been doing this for many, many years, but most of the other people involved in this haven't. It is, it's, it's been joyful for us to see them um, embracing this and seeing the importance of it. And actually, you know, I, I talked about evangelizing. You know, we have people from the, the HSE in Ireland going on with U.S. states to tell them how important all of this is, how it works, and how you know taking this open approach, this source approach, this transparency approach, privacy, data protection, all of these things tying together in that you know the word open, it, it creates a sense of trust, and trust is what then enables these applications to be successful in, in a world where people are tending to be maybe uh, a little bit um, cautious about anything to do with applications and, and phones and so on. And, and that's really all, all I wanted to say on that. I'll, I'll bring it back to Jer now um, to do a little bit of a wrap up. Sure, I think we're, we're slightly over time, but for anyone who's still mm -hmm. on, uh... These are the kind of questions we think we've raised, but I'm sure there are many more or uh, people may be interested in other aspects we haven't covered. So uh, we talked a little bit about open banking, um, very briefly about front end technical debt, which we think is the next frontier for, for pushing open source into the enterprise at a bigger level. And uh, yeah, and I think Connor has really said it well there, that it's a, it's a, it's a story about open source as much as COVID apps, um, uh, what's happened over the last few months. We also have some links here. I'm very happy to publish or pass on any other links that people are interested in if they want more detail um, on any one of the accelerators I mentioned, any one of the apps, any, one, any part of the, the uh, work that we're doing or, or, or even just to have a chat. Uh, very happy to do that. 
Yeah, so thank you very much, um, Jer. That's um, that's really awesome. Um, and before we actually go to the Q and A, um, I'd like to announce the winners that we have um, for the two Finos T-shirts. So I'd like to congratulate Richard from Code Think for winning the Finos T-shirt, um, and Sam Thakuna from Deutsche Bank um, for winning the Finos T-shirt as well. Um, and a member of the Finos team um, will get in contact with you for your address details. Um, we are a little over time, but I think it'll be good to have one question, um, if that's okay. Um, and that comes from Adam Jones, um, who actually asked on chat earlier, uh, are all of your open source accelerators or, or are your accelerator stacks open source? That was the actual question. And Joe, I know that you um, answered this in the chat, but it would be great if um, you could also give the answer um, verbally. So we've got it um, for everybody to, to hear um, later on. Yes. And, and uh, yes, they're using open source. And yes, they are being open sourced one by one. I think that's the answer. Um, so, for example, we originally put the Polaris banking reference app out about three months ago. And the actual code for Polaris is is out and in the wild uh, from about a month and a half ago. I think Mira for cloud uh, native and cloud serverless is out. And I'm pretty sure our SaaS cloud stuff, Titus and Taurus, is already out in the wild. I know that Denise would say we, we, we've done the first few steps and now the community is building around it. But I think they're out. I'd have to check on that. And the next, uh, the others are, uh, will come out as they are ready over the next couple of months. So that's brilliant. So maybe we can um, get an update from you and put that as a, a blog or you know an article on the Finos website, giving people um, some links to to all of your various different open sourced initiatives. Um, okay, and so with that, um, I'd like to say thank you very much for Connor and Jer, um for your uh, presentation this afternoon. I can see in chat. Um, you've got a lot of people who are actually giving you a lot of praise. And so I'd like to say thank you for, for bringing all of your experience of um, building Polaris and your accelerators and the, the COVID app, you know, to the webinar this afternoon. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, everybody who's been here today. Um, feel free to subscribe for newsletters at finos.org um, to hear more about what's coming up in the future. Um, and feel free to also visit um, the Finos organization on GitHub at github.com forward slash Finos um, to see other projects that you can get involved with. Um, so thank you very much, Connor, and thank you very much, um, Jer, for being here today. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Thank you.